the book of 2 Samuel, uh, closing out this book shortly here, we talk about the time of the United Kingdom, uh, the time of David's rule. Uh, David's had a lot of problems in his life, and a lot of things that have gone wrong for him, uh, and it continues that way here. We're going to be looking at, uh, at several things here. Uh, some of this is kind of a review, quickly, from what we had last week. Uh, but uh, the war has, has begun between Absalom and those supporting him and between David and his men. And God has blessed David's men. They've been successful in the battle. We talked about maybe as many as 20,000 uh, people were killed in the battle. Uh, David's men, though, have been successful. Among those killed was Absalom. And uh, when David learns about that and they come back to Jerusalem, uh, David is lamenting that, uh, weeping as he goes up, you know, uh, about the death of his son. And what happens is here that, that Joab, who is the head of David's army, uh, rebukes David for his behavior in this uh, because of the, the bad way that that's going to affect the people. As we look at these verses, chapter 19, verses 5 through 7, Then Joab came into the house to the king and said, Today you have disgraced all your servants, who today have saved your life, the lives of your sons and daughters, the lives of your wives and the lives of your concubines, in that you love your enemies and hate your friends. For you have declared today that you regard neither princes nor servants. For today I perceive that if Absalom had lived and all of us had died today, then it would have pleased you well. Now therefore arise, go out and speak comfort to your servants. For I swear by the Lord, if you do not go out, not one will stay with you this night. And that will be worse for you than all the evil that has befallen you from your youth until now. He condemns David for the behavior of David here. He tells him, you've disgraced all of your servants. Now, how has he done that? And what, what does David's weeping and mourning over his son, why does Joab see, see that as being a disgrace to those men who've supported him and have fought for him? Right, you know, you know, it, it just doesn't make sense. I know Absalom's his son, and a person's going to be concerned about their child, but Joab looks at it more objectively, and he says, you know, listen, if Absalom had won, what would have happened? Well, if Absalom would have won, Joab points out, number one, you would be dead. He, Joab, would be dead. All of your soldiers, all those who supported you, all of your sons and daughters would be dead. Your concubines would be dead. Your wives would be dead. Uh, because if Absalom had won, that's what he's going to do. He's going to get rid of everyone in your family so there won't be anybody that will have a claim to the throne. And so Absalom will be ruling. He'll have to worry about that. And though that's the case, David, you're acting as if it would have been better if Absalom had lived and all the rest of us had died, then you would have been happy with that. And so these soldiers who put their own lives in danger in fighting for David to support him and protect him. Uh, they've got a great victory. And usually, if there's a great victory in, in a battle like this, and, and this is a battle really that ends the war, at the end of something like that, what do you expect to be the reception when they come back into the city? There's going to be a celebration. And these men who have put their lives on the line are going to be honored uh, and, and revered by the people when they come in. But what happens, though, when they come in and they see that what's really happened because of this, that this day of victory has turned into a day of mourning because the very leader of the nation, the king, is the one who's out there weeping and mourning uh, for his own son that was put to death. Uh, and so the soldiers that have fought you know, for David, put their own life in danger, they begin to feel, you know, like, look... Uh, David's not happy with us uh, because he's out there crying his eyes out because of what we've done. And so, you know, it, it, it makes them to feel, you know, like they have failed in some way. Instead of being honored for the gain and victory, you know, David's upset. Maybe he's displeased with them because of that. Uh, David covered his face 
as he's weeping, implying the idea he wanted to be alone in his sorrow. Uh, I had not really known much about this, but uh, his brother Burton Kaufman, in his commentary, talked about this. He says that today's custom of widows wearing a veil is a continuation of that custom. That, that when a widow wears a veil, you know, it, it, it's, it's the whole same idea. She wants to be alone in her sorrow. Uh, that was the idea of it. And even says it goes so far in, into most funerals today, uh, it, at least in a funeral home, they have a separate area for the family to see it. Uh, I've noticed that with several of the funeral homes uh, that I've been in. You know, and it's usually closed off from the rest of the people. And that's that same idea. They're the ones in mourning, you know, that they want to be alone. And so he believes that it all goes back to this time here in David, you know, hiding his face like this, covering his face. He wants to be alone. Uh, he, he doesn't want to be with the others. He, he doesn't want to be out there if there's any kind of celebration going on. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, because he's in sorrow and weeping the way he is, nobody is celebrating. Nobody is content or happy with the victory they've had, and that's why it's all like this. Now, Joab, though, understood what would have happened if Absalom had won the battle uh, better than David does. He understands if Absalom had won, Absalom would have destroyed all of us. And so David needs to understand that and not be, you know, mourning and weeping the way he is doing here. So he rebukes David for it, and the Bible tells us that the king arose and took his seat in the gate, and the people were all told, Behold, the king is sitting in the gate, and all the people came before the king. Uh, so, gets David at least to get out of that state of mourning, get out there with the people, uh, so the people could come to him in this time. Now, the result is here that, that David is going to be restored as king. Remember now, when Absalom rebelled and took the leadership, David had to flee, uh, and there were so many of the men, far more of them, that supported Absalom at that time, especially there uh, among Judah, uh, that are supporting him. So now that, that Absalom's dead, and this rebellion's been put down, David is brought back again to be restored as king on this occasion. Uh, the elders of Judah agreed to bring David back as king. Uh, seems kind of strange, you know, he's He's been anointed three different times to be king. Uh, and the last time, you know, it's, it's there in Judah uh, that he's anointed. But those are his people. Uh, David was from the tribe of Judah. And uh, they had finally accepted him to be the king, and, and now Absalom has rebelled and taken over. And, and Absalom's defeated. David's brought back. So again, once more, Judah uh, has to be the ones to be willing to accept David back. Uh, the ten tribes have talked about that. They had spoke about bringing David back. But now Judah agrees to have him back to be king again over them. Uh, but there are others that rebelled. Remember uh, this man, uh, I don't think I've got that spell right there. Left out an E. Shimei. Uh, he's accepted back and forgiven of his rejection and cursing of David. What do you remember about this man Shimei? cursing at him as he go. And what, what was he saying about David? Calling him what? Call him a bloody man? Because, you know, David had, had been responsible in battle for killing so many, but, you know, uh, Saul has been trying to kill him, and he's had to fight against them. And now Saul's dead, and, and Shimei is mad about this, and he's mad that David's the one. And, and when David is having to flee... Shimei, I think, right, this is justice. You know, you've taken the, the crown from Saul, and now your son's taking it from you, and you're having to flee for your life. This is justice. And he said, in effect, you know, that, that you know, may God, you know, uh, punish you for the way you've done. And one man, uh, Abishai, wanted to do something to Shimei, and that was to go over and cut his head off. And David refused to let him do it, because David said this, this might be part of God's punishment of me to have him do this. And so he will not allow anybody to take the life of Shimei. But now, when it's over, 
And all of a sudden, things changed, uh, and David's going to be king again. What's Shimei's reaction? There's something said here about it that can kind of make me wonder how, how David would be so uh, forgiving here of him. When, when Shimei comes back, he's got 10,000 men of Benjamin with him. Now, to me, that would seem like a threat. But when Shimei comes back, you know, he's in a repentant state. And, and he's asking David to forgive him. Uh, now, David's in the, in the position where he could have taken Shimei's life. And, and again, David might be in a position where now he can think, you know, well, hey, maybe that wasn't God getting him to curse me. Because now God's proven he's accepted me, he's given me the victory, put me back in power again over my son. And so maybe he might feel like Shimei does need to be punished. But David takes a different position, and he forgives Shimei. He allows him to come back to be restored again, but not only him, one other person that's mentioned there, Ziba, who comes back with his 15 sons and 20 servants. Now, who was Ziba? Okay. He, he was a servant of Saul, uh, Saul's grandson, Mephibosheth, had been blessed by David, given, having restored to him all the property and lands of his, his grandfather Saul given the privilege to eat at David's table. But Ziba had told a lie about Mephibosheth to David. What did he tell David Mephibosheth has done? What? Yeah, he, he said, because David was, where's Mephibosheth? You're supposed to be taking care of him. Uh, and when I'm fleeing, you come out here and you brought all these gifts, but where's Mephibosheth? And Ziba lied and said, Mephibosheth chose to stay back there. Uh, with the new king, because he believes maybe that the kingdom's going to be restored to him now and all that he had. And so David thinks, well, all right, Mephibosheth has turned against me. And so he tells Ziba, all of that land that I'd given to Mephibosheth that belonged to Saul, I'm now giving that to you. So when Ziba comes back with these people, you know, uh, he's in that situation now where it's, it's going to be learned or is learned that he was lying about Mephibosheth. But again, you know, uh, he is not uh, put to death for that. And instead of that, the, the land is divided equally between the two. Uh, and so he's restored back. Uh, so it looks like we're getting to be a time of peace again and everything's settling down. But when we get to this next chapter, and this is where we're spend the most of our time tonight, really, the Gibeonites' revenge. Who are the Gibeonites? Yeah, they're, they're the ones that deceived Israel. They were one of the tribes there that should have been destroyed, uh, but they lied uh, to the people of Israel. They claimed, hey, we're, we're not from this land. We don't live here in this land. You know, we're, we're from a far country, and they deceived them into believing that so that Israel's leaders made a bargain with them not to destroy the Gibeonites. And then they found out later that the Gibeonites did indeed live in the land of Palestine. And they are among those that should have been put to death. But now they can't do it because they've made an agreement, you know, uh, an agreement in the name of God that they will not, you know, put them to death. So what they do is they make them into servants. So what we have here now, the Gibeonites are coming back and, and the revenge that they're after in regard to David. This, this is a rather lengthy uh, reading here. It's not that many verses, but there's some long verses that I want to look at here. It begins by saying, Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house, because he killed the Gibeonites. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. The children of Israel had sworn protection to them. But Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. Therefore David said to the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you, and with what shall I make atonement, that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? And the Gibeonites said to him, 
We will have no silver or gold from Saul or from his house, nor shall you kill any man in Israel for us. So he said, Whatever you say, I will do for you. Then they answered the king, and they said, uh, As for the man who consumed us and plotted against us, that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the territories of Israel, let seven men of his descendants be delivered to us, and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord chose. And the king said, I will give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. So the king took Armoni and Mephibosheth, the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, whom she bore to Saul, and the five sons of Michael, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Maholathite. And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them, on the hill before the Lord. So they fell, all seven together, and were put to death in the days of the harvest, in the first days in the beginning of barley harvest. Now what happens here is one of the real tragedies in the times of Saul's leadership as king. Uh, it all begins with a famine in the land that's lasted for three years. Now that's a pretty long time for a famine to go. You know, you, you may have a, a bad year, maybe even two years, but when you get to three years, you know something's wrong. And so David goes to God. Now, keep that in mind because this is important. He goes to God to make inquiry about it. In other words, you know, God, why are we suffering here from this famine? Why are you allowing this to happen? What did God tell him? Because of what? Because of Saul. Saul tried to kill the Gibeonites. Now, the Gibeonites had deceived Israel, but Israel was the one that was their fault. They could have gone to God and found out from God about it, but they didn't do that. And they went ahead and made that agreement with the Gibeonites uh, and swore to them an oath uh, by God that they would not destroy them. But Saul, in his zeal for the nation, became angry, and he did try to destroy them. And so that's why... God has brought this famine upon them. Something has to be done. So what does David do then? When he finds out the problem, the problem is what Saul's done to the Gibeonites, how does David try to handle this problem? Yeah, what can I do for you? There, that's at least mistake number one. It may be number two. But it's a mistake he made. Why, why was he wrong to go to the Gibeonites? I can see two good reasons out of it. Number one, what happened the last time they talked to the Gibeonites? They were deceived. They were tricked. They were lied to by them. And now David goes to them this time, and he says, what should I do for you? Uh, you know, he ought to be a little bit reluctant to think that these people are going to be honest with me because they're not honest at all in what they have to say to him. If you look at it, when, when he says here, in, in verse 3, uh, what shall I do for you, and with what shall I make atonement that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? And listen closely to what the Gibeonites said. We will have no silver or gold from Saul or from his house, nor shall you kill any man of Israel for us. All right, David, I want you to understand, first of all, you, you want to know what, what we need, what we'll require before, you know, you can be forgiven for what Saul did. Understand this, number one, we're not expecting you to pay any gold or silver to us. Nothing like that. And, and we're not asking you to kill anybody, you know. And, and so David's thinking, okay, you know, they don't want money. They're not bloodthirsty to have anybody put to death. Uh, so he says, then tell me what it is, whatever you want, I'll do it. Bad mistake. Because uh, he's been deceived again by the Gibeonites. The Gibeonite says, we don't want you to put anybody to death. But what did they want? Yeah, yeah. You, you give us the men, and we'll put them to death. And what we want are, the, are seven sons of Saul. And David doesn't even try to get out of it. You know, he, 
he's happy to go home with that and, and to give those seven boys over to them. Uh, but a second problem with that. This is the second time they've been deceived by the Gibeonites, but again, the second time. Why are they deceived by the Gibeonites? Again, didn't go to God to find out what they should do. Now, it's interesting, when the famine's been there for three years, what's the first thing David does? He goes to God and wants to know about it. But when God tells him why, then he goes to the Gibeonites for a solution to the problem. You know, you've gone to people that have deceived you before, and you've trusted them, and you've been deceived again. And you didn't go to God as you should have. And so, you know, he, he's making the same mistake uh, in doing this. Uh, all right. Joshua 9, 15. Joshua had made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live, and the rulers of the congregation swore to them. So, he, he you know, that's, that's why nothing was done to them initially, but now they're getting even with them for that. Uh, I should have been clicking on this as I go through. I get talking. Uh He's asked them what to do. We don't need gold or silver or for David to kill anyone, but we need these seven bodies, these seven men of Saul. And, and that's what they asked for. Because David said, whatever you want, I'll do for you. And what do they do to those seven boys? They hang them. Uh, the text says hang them on a wall. I think literally the Hebrew says on a mountain. Uh, we're not told exactly you know, how this was done. Usually when I think of the word hanging, I think of the old west, you know, when somebody's being hung with a rope. But, but probably in all likelihood, they're impaled in some way uh, on, onto a wall, maybe. Uh, that's their way uh, of getting even with them. And David consents to it and allows that to be happened, to give that over to them that, that they might be put to death. Uh, now here's the thing about this. This will go. So those seven boys are hung by the Gibeonites. And there's one woman there, Mizpah, who comes out and she's there day and night where the bodies are hung on the wall. And what is she doing? Yeah, protecting them from the, from the birds or, or from the beasts. Uh, two of those boys that are hanging there are her sons. And she cannot bear the thought of their bodies being desecrated. It's bad enough they've been put to death, but now they're not given a proper burial. They're left to hang on that wall. And you know what's going to happen when the birds come in? They'll feed off of those bodies. And the wild beasts will do the same. But she stays out there day and night, keeping all those animals away from those boys. And finally, David hears about it. And that had to tug at David's heart uh, of this woman out there constantly to do that. So David gives commands that the bodies are to be brought down off the wall. And then he takes up the bones of uh, Saul and Jonathan uh, and, and gathers them all together. And he takes and he buries them back in their land uh, where uh, their fathers had been buried. But there's some very valuable lessons to learn here in this. Number one, ask yourself the question, why were the sons of Saul there? Why were those seven boys there? I know they're, they've been hung, they've been put to death, but why? They're there because their father had sinned. And now they're, they're suffering the consequences of it. They're being punished. For what their father, these men were innocent. They haven't done anything wrong. They're not responsible for what was done to the Gibeonites. That was the work of their father, Saul. But they're being punished for it. Uh, all right, Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20. God declared, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Uh, an innocent person may suffer the consequences uh, of the sin of a parent. You know, 
if a mother, while she's pregnant, is on drugs, and that child may be born with all kinds of birth defects, may be born an addict themselves, uh, even though they're innocent, they may be suffering because of the sins of the mother. But what God's talking about here in Ezekiel 18.20, the son is not going to be punished, you know, for the sins that the father committed. Uh, the soul that sinneth, what? It shall die. Now, you know, you're not going to kill the son because the father did something evil. Uh, but in this case, it's happened. Seven of those boys have been put to death because their daddy had sinned. Uh, and, and putting to death those Gibeonites. And so they're there because of the sins of others. Now, ask yourself the question, why were the Gibeonites there? What's brought them to that place? Revenge. That, that, that's what they're interested in. They're there because of their desire for revenge. They are wanting to get even with this man Saul. They, they describe Saul here, he's the man who's tried to destroy us, that we will not have any part in this land. And so they're ready to, to get their vengeance on him. Well, they can't do it because he's dead, but we can get vengeance by putting to death his sons that we have here. And so that's what they want to do. They want to get even with it. Now, the thing of it is, they craftily planned this, just like before. You know, when they tried to tell Israel, we're not of this land, we're from a far country. Remember we talked about they put on old clothing? And old shoes, so they could say to the people, you know, you don't know how far we've traveled. These clothes were brand new when we left home, and now look at them. That shows you how long we've been traveling. And our food, it's showing bread that's covered with mold. We took this fresh out of the oven when we left home, and now look at it. You know, very crafty in what they had planned to deceive Israel. Now they're doing the same thing again. Uh, they, they have craftily planned this lying to David. We, we're not David. We're not asking for any kind of payment, no gold or silver. We're not expecting you to go out and kill anybody uh, to satisfy us and, and to make things right again. But when David says, whatever you want, I'll do for you, then it's a, you give us those seven sons and we'll put them to death. And so they've deceived them again craftily in doing this, but all because of their desire for revenge. Now, Romans chapter 12, verses 19 to 21. Paul said, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So, Paul told the brethren at Rome that they're not to seek vengeance. And basically, there, there are three good reasons that he gives as to why we should not seek revenge. Number one, Paul said there in Romans, vengeance belongs to God. You know, you let God take care of that. Now, there are different ways that God might take care of that, that he might take vengeance on someone. Number one, he might do it through the use of the government. Uh, in Romans chapter 13, when Paul talks about the role and the responsibility of government, one of the things he says was, if, if you do evil, be afraid. Why? Because the government does not bear the sword of God in vain. They have the authority from God to punish those who are evildoers. And so it may be that God will use the government to get vengeance on those who have done evil. And so... That's not your prerogative. That's God. You let God do it. Number two, uh, I think he points out there in Romans, to treat a person with kindness is the way to move a man's heart. You can break his heart uh, by doing something evil to him. But if you want to move his heart, if you want to change him, then you're going to have to do that with kindness. Uh, and, and I think that's absolutely true. Uh, Someone turn to 2 Kings for me in just a moment. 2 Kings chapter 6. And we want to look at verses 21 through 23. I think we've talked about this passage before, but 
2 Kings 6, verses 21 to 23. Ansel, do you have that? You can read it. You know, this is the time, you know, when the, these soldiers had come out to take uh, Elijah, and, uh, and when his servant went out, he saw them, and he came in, he was fearful, and Elijah told him, don't be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And, and he asked God to open the eyes of his servant, he looked and saw those uh, uh, chariots of fire all around them. And so what happens is, that, and he prayed to God to strike these soldiers that have come in from Syria, strike them blind, and God did. And then they went out, and they led them. They said, this is not the place. And they led them away to the city of Samaria and lead them into that city. And there in Samaria, they're surrounded now by the Jewish army. And then he prays to God to open their eyes. And he opens their eyes, and they look around. And all of a sudden, we're surrounded completely by our enemies. And the captain of the Jewish army says, shall we slay them? Shall we slay them? And he said, no. You, you wouldn't do that to those you've captured in, in battle. He says, you set food and water before them, let them eat, then send them on their way to the master. And the Bible says they gave a great feast for them. And can you think of anything more idiotic than that? You've got your enemies captured, you can destroy them, and instead of doing that, you give them a great feast and then send them away. But you notice that last verse? The band of Syrian raiders came no more in the land of Israel. You know, Paul says, if your enemy hungers, give him something to eat. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. You know, for so doing, you'll keep heap coals of, of fire upon his head. You know, the shame and embarrassment you bring him uh, cost him to change his actions. And that's what's happened here. So kindness is a way to move a man's heart. That's one reason why we shouldn't take vengeance ourselves upon others. Let God do it. That's his prerogative. And realize that if you take vengeance on them, that's not going to change them. Uh, that's only going to harden them more. But kindness is the way to do it if you're going to bring them back. Now, the third reason. Paul also points out there to stoop to the level of the one doing, doing evil is to be overcome of evil. If you take vengeance, Paul, remember Paul said uh, to them, uh, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Uh, so, you know, you, you can't overcome it by, by doing evil to them. George Washington Carver made this statement one time. He said, I will not allow any man to make me lower myself by hating me. In other words, he says, if I stoop to their level, if they hate me and they want to destroy me, if I in turn hate them, I've become just like them. And he said, I'm not going to let anybody do that to me. I'm not going to let anybody cost me to get down on their level by hating them. Uh, he understood what Paul was talking about, you know, that, that how you treat people, how you react to them and do that. So these people there, uh, they're, they're there for vengeance but they have no right for that. That's not something we're to do. Now, third person I want to talk about. Why was Rizpah there? Why did she come to that place where seven boys were being hung? What motivated her? What? Love. She, she's motivated by love. I was talking, two of those boys are her own sons. And, and, and because of her love for them... She can't abide the thought of, of their bodies being desecrated by wild animals or by these birds, and so she's there to keep all those away. And she stays with them until finally David gives in and allows those bodies to be taken down and be properly buried. So she's there because of love that she has. And that's, that's an important thing about it. Somebody said one time uh, that the love of a mother is the strongest love known among humans. And that's probably true. Rudyard Kipling uh, wrote a poem about mothers one time when he said, If I were hanged on the highest hill, mother of mine, oh mother of mine, I know whose heart would be loving me still. Mother of mine, mother of mine. If I were drowned in the deepest sea, mother of mine, oh mother of mine, I know whose tears would flow down for me. Mother of mine, oh mother of mine. If I were damned of body and soul, 
Mother of mine, oh mother of mine, I know whose prayers would make me whole. Mother of mine, oh mother of mine. The love of a mother for her child is probably the greatest love known among human beings. This mother, because of the love she has for her children, stays out there morning, noon, and night to keep those animals away. I don't know if anybody was bringing food to her or water or anything like that or whether she's just out there disregarding all of that. She's out there because of the love that she has for those children. Now, three different people there for three different reasons. Now, consider this. Just a few miles from that site, and a number of years later on another hill, we see another son being hung. But this time it's on a cross. And, and, and we think about that. Look to the third, the person on that middle cross there, and ask this same question. Why are you here? Why are you here? And Jesus might answer that by saying, I'm here because of revenge. You know, there were those among the Pharisees and the scribes that hated Jesus and sought diligently to bring about his death. Uh, the, there, there was a group of people there known as Herodians. Now, the Herodians, uh, you know, they... they Herod, supposedly, was Jewish, but he and, and others of his group, you know, worked with the Romans. And so because of that reason, the other Jews considered them to be, you know, evil, to be unclean because they'd given themselves over to working with them. And so the Pharisees would not have anything to do with the Herodians until the time came when, when they were so intent on bringing about the death of Jesus, you know, that... Uh, they made an agreement. The Herodians and the Pharisees would work together to bring about the death of Jesus. That's what they wanted to do. So, Mark chapter 3 and verse 6 says, Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. They're willing to work with anybody, even their biggest enemies. They'll work with them if we can bring about the death of Jesus. And that's why they're there. They're there for revenge. They want to get even with this man. Because Jesus ha has proven them wrong on every time they've ever challenged him. Uh, they've been shown up to be false in what they were teaching and advocating. And they couldn't stand that. And they're determined to destroy him. And so they're there, you know, because of that revenge. So why is Jesus? He's there because of vengeance. There are those people just like the Gideons hated Saul and wanted to get even with him. These Pharisees and scribes hated Jesus and they wanted to get even with him. And this is the way they were doing it. Uh, ask him again. And Jesus would say, I'm also here because of the sins of others. How many sins had Jesus committed? None. Never committed a single sin. Then why is he dying on the cross? If he never sinned, why is he dying? Because of our sins. Uh, you, you look at all these passages. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Over and over again in that verse it talks about it. It's because of our sins that Jesus died there. Romans 4, 25 who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Delivered up. Delivered over to be put to death. Why? Because of our offenses. Because of the sins that we had committed. Then in 1 Peter 2, 24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. And by the way, uh, that word stripes there, plural. Uh, Brother Guy in Woods in his commentary points out that in the original, that word is singular. By his stripe, we are healed. And he suggests the idea is that the Roman scourging that he received was so brutal that continually beating across there to finally all of those stripes that he's hit with blend together as one gigantic stripe down his body. And it's by his stripe we're healed. Jesus was there on the cross because of our sins. But ask him one more time, why are you here? And Jesus would say, I'm also here because of love. 
because of the love that he has for all of us. Uh, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 15, 13, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. And so Jesus is there because of love. Uh, and so to me, that there, there's a tremendous lesson to see here in, in the relationship between the death of those seven sons of Saul's and why they're put to death and the death of Christ and why he's there present on that cross. He's there because of vengeance. He's there because of the sins of others. And he's there because of the love that he has that all men might be redeemed. Uh, now, one other passage, Romans 5, 6 to 8. Uh, put this on there. This is one of my son's favorite passages of all the New Testament. But when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, so the love that he has is why he went to the cross. And that's what held him to the cross in order that he might die that we could be redeemed. Okay? So, tremendous to me, a tremendous lesson uh, for us to learn here uh, from the events that are happening here when the Gibeonites take those seven sons and hang them uh, there on the wall. And, and there's something else. It's not just the love that he had for us, but the love that he had for God. He died in order to accomplish the will of God. Uh, that was one of the reasons why he was willing to die. Because that was the only way of, of, a den of a saving mankind, though, that he did that. All right, now, when we get to chapter 22. Did I not put that up here? All right, maybe not. Chapter 22, here in Second Samuel. It's almost word for word identical with Psalm 18. Uh, and, and I look trying to compare the two and what it's like. Uh, the first, uh, well, the entire chapter is praise to God. And the same thing, of course, in Psalms 18. It's the same thing, praising God. But uh, verses 1 through 3 uh, that you have here, uh, he is really... Glorying, glorifying God uh, and glorying in the Lord what he's done. I have to read this here. Someone read the first three verses there. Of chapter 22, please. And David spake unto the Lord the word of this song in the, in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all the enemies and cast out the, the hand and he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. The God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my Savior. Thou savest me from violence. Do you notice, yeah, the first three verses there. David here is, is giving praise to God, but he speaks about God here because of what God has done for him. And look at how the different ways it refers to God. Number one, he says, the Lord is my rock. Now, what's the value in that? How, how is God being a rock a value to David? Sir? Foundation. Okay. There's several things about stone. He mentioned there, he's, you know, he doesn't change. Uh, Ed pointed out foundation, uh, something else about a rock. And especially if you look at it here, he says, my rock and my fortress. What's a fortress? A place of protection. Uh, we need to realize, and, and I think we all do this, of course, God is far more powerful than we are. Uh, and there are going to be so many times we can't protect ourselves. We're not going to be provide for.
for ourselves what we need. We don't understand. God's our rock. He's our fortress. He has that strength uh, that to protect us. Uh, I've talked about this before in the book of Proverbs when Solomon talks about four things that are strong. And, and one of the things he talks about, uh, or mighty rather, he says, is, is the coney, which is a rabbit-like animal. It's very weak physically, uh, has a lot of enemies, but the thing about the coney is that he makes his home in the rocks. You know, he's dependent upon something stronger than himself to save himself from his enemies, and that's what David has done. He, he regards God as, as his rock, his fortress. And when he says he's my deliverer, literally, uh, the Hebrew there is he's my escape. Uh, God delivers him from the danger that he's in. God's the way of escape that he has. Uh, God will provide for us a way of escape whenever we're tempted. And we need to understand and appreciate that. Okay, I didn't realize we were getting that close time. It, it's past time. Uh, let's begin with this, Lord willing, next week and talk about this as we go through this uh, chapter. And then after that, we're going to talk some about uh, the mighty men of David. And again, there are a lot of good lessons there. Let's have a, a word of prayer here as we're dismissed. Father, we pray you'll be with us throughout this evening and throughout the remainder of this week to keep us in your care and safety and help us to yield ourselves unto thee always, Father, to allow thee to be that rock and that fortress that we need to protect us. And may we, Father, show our love for thee by our living for thee in obedience to thy will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.